The way Encore came about was pretty um, one step after the next. Primarily, I was sort of finding out that I didn't have any live recording per se, uh, and, and it was in, op in opposition with the reality of my life, which is basically touring for the, almost the last 40 years. And so the, the music live is surprisingly quite different from the music uh, on CD, the music, the music played in the studio, because everything is different, the ambience, the context, the the risk taking, the the um, urgency to deliver something in front of an audience, which is not the same in front of a mic in the, the intimacy of a of a live room, you know, and stuff like that. And so I think I was not really pushing for having anything live recorded. My my. Maybe it was because for me something live belongs to the instant, to the moment, and when it's done, it belongs to the past. It's no longer a reality. It's 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 done. And I had never really um, run after going out of my way to have a lot of live recordings made. You know, I could have organized, for instance, to have an entire tour recorded, which, as a matter of fact, I did once when I played with Didier Malherbe. And, uh, and surprisingly, we had this show in Paris, which really worked fine. And so we did that live record in, I think it was in 1997, called Live in Paris with DDA. And that CD is the only CD which, you know, from the beginning till the end is a live recording of the both of us. And I did also a live DVD in 96, one year before, for Stefan Grossman Guitar Workshop, called uh, In Concert, it was in Berkeley, near San Francisco. And that was the best take out of two shows, two days, consecutive two days played in that club called Freight and Salvage in Berkeley. But other than that, I never had anything. And I remember people coming to the shows asking, do you have anything that what we heard tonight? And I said, well, yes, I do, but it's not exactly the same. You know, tonight was quite different, was improvised with some of it. And, you know, it was what you had tonight. It will not be the same tomorrow. And they felt like, oh, this is disappointing, you know, but okay, in, where is the city where we can find this tune and that tune? So I was telling people that tune belongs to that city. And, but I obviously knew that something was missing. And, um, and my friend Jack, who is also um, Jacques Panis, who I work with in France, said, you are going next year to celebrate your 40th anniversary in the music business. I think you should have a new album and why don't you have uh, an album reflecting of all those years spent on the road you know and I said wow that's a great idea but now I have to listen to all those shows that I have packed and, and, and never listened to and I was afraid to listen to that shows because there was nothing I could do about them it's done if it was not good it was like oh no I did that that's why I never listened to them um, for most of them I never listened and so I started to, and I knew it will take me off, off track for at least a good three months. And you know, I cannot afford three months off the road, off playing, just to dedicate to production of a CD. It's a big commitment, it's a big step. But I thought, well, that's, it's going to be either now or never. So I, um, it was okay, I didn't have a lot of tour, so I took those three months off and started to revisit the past. First it was going to be recordings from 98 until 2013. And then I remembered I had done a, one of my con earlier, very earlier concerts, the first tour of my life with banjo player Bill Keith. I was playing mandolin in his bluegrass band. But that's another thing I did, you know, play bluegrass for quite a couple of years professionally. Um, it was a show that we did near Lausanne in Switzerland, recorded by the Swiss radio, and I had this reel-to-reel -reel tape that I had listened 
several times, but I had not listened to it for the last 20 years for the good reason that I do not have a Revox to play that real to real anymore. So, but I remembered there was something there, and I remembered that Bill asked me to play some solo guitar in the middle of the show, and it was even before I recorded my first uh, CD, Près de Paris. I thought I should listen to that again because why not having a bit of that concert in that city? And I'm sure Bill and Jim, Jim Rooney, so, you know, who is who was pairing with Bill touring together at that time, he's a singer. I'm sure they will be. I hope they will be okay. I'm sure they will allow me to use it. And Leon Franchelli on upright bass also. So I listened to that and I thought, wow, bluegrass. <laughs> the people are going to be so shocked, so surprised to see, to hear some of this music on that CD. They are definitely not expecting anything like this. Even in America, where I tour a lot, people don't even know I, I was a bluegrass musician for. So I, I found two, two tunes that the quartet played together, me and the mandolin singing the high pitch, and, and, and then three pieces on guitar, one song in English, that's the only English song which is on the, on this triple CD and two other instrumentals and the, the audience very very enthusiastic and so you know it's it's in fact recordings from 75 up to 2013 so it's a big big scope a big scope so I was very fortunate to um, in my one of my idol was Doc Watson and uh, I had made my first record and I was friend with someone who promoted the second show of Doc Watson in Paris at the Olympia Theater. And he said to me, in fact it was a second concert, but at the first concert, Alain, the promoter, the same guy, it was like one year before, gave Doc Watson my first CD. The second time Doc came back to Paris, he asked Alain to meet me. He said, "Could I would like to see Pierre, the young Pierre, and I, I love the expression to see because he was blind, you know. I'd like to see Pierre and I'd like to speak with him. So Alain called me and said, Doc wants to meet you. Uh, okay. So I went to, to the concert and I, I brought a few près de Paris, my first city. And I'm, I met this man. It was like, you know, it's and beyond words, you know, I was like a little mouse mouse in a corner, you know, and he was very enthusiastic, very supportive, you know, very um, taken by, by my way of playing guitar and by the music, and in the corner was, there was a guy, very uh, discreet, and it was his manager, and I met him, his name was Manny Greenhill, and I gave Manny my first record too, you know, I didn't lose a North, I bought a few records with me just in case, and then I went home and I was like not touching the floor, you know. And the year after that, it was 78, I thought, let's organize me to go to America and to get a car and travel. I was like 18, 19, and so it's a good time to visit this place, which is so important for the music, you know. And, um, and I will stop, meet musicians, learn from them, make new friends and make my way like that. And then I thought, Wow, and what about doing a few shows? What about playing to, to, um, to support my, my trip? And so my second sister, uh, Sarah, was on her way to Los Angeles for a study. And she, I don't know how that came about, but she ended up being interviewed on a, on a radio station in Los Angeles about cooking. Like she was French. Oh, can you please tell us about cooking? Yes, so she talked about cooking and, and, and then she talked about her younger brother uh, who was a musician and, and, he, and she knew I would like to come to the States so, and she asked the people at the radio station if they knew anyone who could help me. Oh yes, we, knew Manny, we know Manny Greenhill, he's in Santa Monica just next door. Why don't you uh, give him a call? And so through her she called Manny and Manny remembered meeting me and he said, Oh, Pierre wants to come? I organized a tour for him, I'd be his manager. And so when I met Manny, I realized that he was the guy who created the first folk club in Boston, Club 48, where John Baez and Bob Dylan used to play all the time. And he was also the founder of the first, the first folk festival, the Newport Folk Festival. He was in fact Mr. Folk Music. 
and this was my manager and I was young and I you know it was it was so weird the way all those things came about so instead of being a tour with a few shows to support my tour it became a, a touring concert tour for three months with a, a car that I bought in Boston Bill Keith helped me to find a car and I drove all my way you know, 15,000 miles in three months, played 33 shows, had my trunk stacked with vinyls, 800s, saw them all. And I started to go to America all the time, like at least once a year. Doing the folk circuit and the acoustic music circuit and performing arts festivals, guitar world circuit and all that stuff. And ended up being invited all the time into uh, this club called the Prism in Charlottesville, in Virginia, which is like a couple of hours away from Washington, D.C. And they asked me at some point, why don't we do two shows with you, Pierre? We do one show, this is a university town, the university founded by Thomas Jefferson. Why don't we do two shows, one in French and one in English? And the show in French, you had to speak only French. And there are a lot of Fran Francophile people here in this town and the second show in English. And so we started this uh, uh, tradition. And every show was recorded by the radio. And of course, I never heard any of those recordings. I just knew the radio had recorded them, but it was like, why, why, why do I need to, to hear those, sh those shows, you know? And when this idea of live record came about, I remembered all those shows. And so I met Peter Jones, the director of the folk station, of the folk program on the station. I don't remember the name, it starts with W something. Sorry. And uh, I said, Peter, would it be possible for you, if it's not too much work, to at some point, whenever you have a chance, to put together all those recordings? Because I'm, you know, I have this project, I would love to, to listen to them. And he said, It's going to take me a while, but I will do it, Pierre. It took him six months. So, six months later, I got like a pile of CDs of recordings, like 15 shows. And it was amazing. It was amazing, I totally forgot all those things. So a good quarter of the content of Encore comes from the Charlottesville sessions. Another comes from other shows in America, New York, um, uh, Mill Valley near San Francisco, Toronto, uh, Guelph in Ontario, uh, Washington, Bethlehem in Pennsylvania and stuff like that. Some of the shows come from the north of France with Jordan. Um, and another show comes, another recording comes from Graz in Austria. And also another one comes from Limerick in Ireland. You know, just very randomly, you know, about on a, a sort of maybe 3,000 shows that I've been playing, only you know, less than 100 were recorded. I met Jordan when I was uh, teaching in a summer uh, school north of New York in Connecticut, in New Milford, and Jordan was teaching too. It was just before he became a Korg world demonstrator for Korg, Korg keyboards, and we really uh, enjoyed meeting. And um, my wife was also touring with me, Doatea, and so we were invited to Sister Jordan and Daniel, his wife. They live in um, you know, upstate New York, like 45 minutes away from Manhattan. So we, we stayed there, we hung out together and, and jammed and played. And then a few years later, I was invited, I was commissioned to do a, a creation for 200 uh, children choir from 8 to 16. And uh, so it was going to be 200 singers and, it, and I was thinking, and only me on guitar, that's going to be really weird. So I asked Jordan to join me, I invited him. I flew in from New York, came and we spent one week in my home rehearsing. I did uh, spend three months before writing the scores and all that stuff. Then Jordan came, we rehearsed like four or five days in my house and moved to the north of France and spent three, four, five days there rehearsing with the children. And uh, Jordan was amazing to work with. He was totally available for anything, you know, f um, very, very used to work with choirs because I, when his years with Juilliard School in New York, he was also working with choirs, so he knew exactly what to do to give them the first note so they had the pitch. And children loved him. 
they loved the sound he was creating. You know, you have to imagine those eight-year-olds, they were like fascinated by the sounds coming from that keyboard. And, um, and we had a lot of fun. So we did a show uh, in the north of France, in Boulogne. And the show was split into three parts. Uh, my, the first part was me playing solo. The second part, I invited Jordan to join me and we played two duets and then intermission and the second set was going to be all the choirs together and the two of us. And so the two um, tunes that we played in duet were only played then, was recorded. I listened to them and I thought, let's use them, it's fine, it's really fine, it's happening, it's musical. And I asked Jordan if it was, if it was fine, he was very gracious to allow me to use those recordings. At the beginning, it was not planned to be a triple CD at all. It was just planned to be a CD, one CD, pretty, maybe 60 minutes long. And um, there, were, there were about 50 or 60 shows to choose for, from. And uh, it started to be, become a challenge to, to harmonize those moods, those sounds, those acoustics, the playing, which very often it was not aimed to be recorded. It was just a left and right out of the soundboard to a recorder. To, uh, so um, thanks to, uh, to Rich Breen and to you, Dave, we have been, you have been mixing some of it, Rich has been missing most of it, and we, we came up with a great, um, a great uh, overall rendition of, of that life spent, you know. And it, it took three CDs, because I suddenly said, oh, maybe one CD is not going to be enough, let's make two CDs. Two CDs is doable, yeah. Any, anything about two CDs will start to be like a little bit too much. And then after two CDs, it was like, oh, we need maybe more. <laughs> And then I realized that I was not going to stop. I was going to go, you know, okay, three CDs, great. Even four CDs, fine, we'll make four CDs. I realized that or that you, you know, you multiply the cost by two, by three and everything, but that was not, that was not relevant at that time. <laughs> 